This is Origin Stories, the Leaky Foundation podcast. I'm Meredith Johnson. In almost every other species, an animal's lifespan typically ends once they stop being able to have babies. One thing that's special about humans is that we live on well past our reproductive years, especially women. We can live to take on another special role. We can be grandmothers. Producer Skylar Swenson has our story. No matter where you're from, at a certain point in one's adult life, the social expectation to have kids sets in. Traditionally, no one puts on the pressure quite as much as dear old mom. Sometimes it comes in the form of a subtle gesture or casual offhand remark. Let's call them motherly micro-suggestions. My friend Eli, for example, he's in his late 20s, and his parents recently decided to make a bold move from their home in a Jersey suburb to be closer to him in Brooklyn, where they're restoring an old brownstone. Here's Eli and his mother, Claudia. Oh, so I guess it was like the first time I was really looking at the house after you bought it. We were, you know, guys were touring me around and we were kind of like upstairs in the, in the big old guest room area. And there's like that little room <laughs> off the guest room area. And it was just like a funny, it's a funny little room. Like, what do you do with that little room? Um, and <laughs> very, a crib? Yeah, very reasonably, it would be a good room to have a... Little but Eli, person. I never said anything like that, but I call it the crib room. <laughs> and you I didn't even know that. <laughs> it's, it's just, That's the funny thing, is that you didn't even know that. Yeah, well, I, I guess I could infer. I, I mean you didn't even have to say anything. I just uh, That's so interesting because I know we certainly showed you around this place that we had bought and all the rooms in it, but I very specifically (laughs) recall suppressing any thoughts of describing anything like that, which just goes to show you that kids can read their parents' minds no matter what. (laughs) Moms can try to suppress their grandmotherly thoughts, but is the micro-suggestion unavoidable? Maybe it's just human nature. Professor Kristen Hawkes is an evolutionary anthropologist at the University of Utah, and since the 1980s, her work has focused on grandmas, specifically an idea about human evolution called the grandmother hypothesis. Hawkes says that not only is it in our nature to grandmother, grandmothering is what makes us human. So at this point, you might be picturing grannies in rocking chairs, cradling babies and thinking, that's adorable, but how could these old ladies really be the key to human evolution? The grandmother hypothesis that I'm talking about isn't one about knitting booties. It's about making sure the kids are fed. That's Professor Hawks. About 30 years ago, Hawks was working as a behavioral ecologist, observing hunter-gatherer communities and studying their foraging habits. She was curious about what they ate and why. I'm especially interested in hunter-gatherers because that's where people are living on wild foods, which is what all of our ancestors did until very recently. So I went into that work kind of assuming what still is the sort of the textbook story about human evolution, that it's all about hunting and the hunting hypothesis. The hunting hypothesis essentially argues that human evolution was shaped by our ability to hunt animals that the act of hunting is what distinguishes us from other hominids. It really focuses on the male hunter as the primary breadwinner, as the key to how humans got to where we are today. Uh, Men hunt and women do the domestic stuff, take care of the kids. And so we get that whole package as a consequence of a shift to hunting. Makes total sense. In fact, Hawks didn't really question the hunting hypothesis when she began studying the Hadza, They're a hunter-gatherer community in Tanzania, and they're one of the few remaining groups of people who live on wild food. She noticed that the men tended to go for the high-risk, high-reward food options, hunting big game. Women, on the other hand, tend to make choices about resources where the predictability is really high. You almost don't fail. The women were gathering things like tubers from the ground, getting a steady supply of food that the family could depend on. And to Hawks' surprise, an unassuming family member was pulling a considerable amount of weight. 
And, you know, there it was right before my eyes, you know, accumulating in the notebooks. And uh, day after day, these old ladies, these old ladies, I never thought, wow, the old ladies are going to be important, so important in uh, their economic productivity. Hawks watched older women spend their days foraging foods for their grandchildren. And she started to see that the more a grandmother helps out, the more the kids thrived. When moms moved on to have a new baby, the previous kid depended on somebody else. And that dependence was really crucial in how well they did. And this is where Hawks got to the grandmother hypothesis. She saw that when older women helped gather food for their daughter's kids, it allowed their daughters to have more children more quickly. Hawks argues that women have two reproductive periods, when they're raising their own babies as mothers and when they're raising their babies' babies as grandmothers. They're reproducing copies of their genes, even though not having more babies. But it's that that allows the women in the fertile ages to have babies as fast as we do, much faster than the other apes. She says that women's longevity past the years of menopause is what really distinguishes humans from our closest living relatives. For chimpanzees and other apes, female fertility ends, on average, at about 45, which is the same age as humans. But the big difference is that it's really rare for a female chimpanzee or gorilla or bonobo or orangutan to outlive her fertility. They get to be old and display these kind of geriatric symptoms, you know, frail, stiff, and so on, and are vulnerable to the kinds of things that mean they usually die before the end of their fertility. Early hominids probably aged like chimps do. But at some point along the way, a few of our ancestors must have lived longer. And the grandmother hypothesis is specific about the conditions that would make these long lives pay off for our species. Like a lot of things in human evolution, it's related to food. When chimps and other apes are weaned, they're weaned to foods the kids can handle on their own. They don't need help, but our ancestors were dealing with changing climates, and they had to rely on things like tubers that aren't as easy to manage. If we imagine an ancestral condition that had a great ape-like life history, and we had an ecological change in which uh, the use of resources that little kids just really can't manage on their own was a payoff strategy, but what it would mean for for any of those ancestors who did it, that that using those resources, uh, moms would have to be subsidizing their kids. So if there are some women around who are living longer and they don't have young babies of their own to deal with, they can help. And if they help their, their daughters so the daughters could move on and have kids sooner, then that variation in the direction of slightly greater longevity, those that had those longevity genes would pass those genes on to more descendants. And so as across subsequent generations, longevity would increase. So women who stay alive and active longer have the most grandchildren, and those grandchildren inherit her longevity-promoting genes. You might think that when women stop having kids, they stop playing a role in passing on their genes. But it turns out that a grandmother's help makes all the difference. Without grandma, mom has to continue to support her infants one at a time, until they're old enough to feed themselves. She has to wait to have the next baby. But if she has help, then she can have the next baby sooner. Mothering is not an independent activity for us, as it is for the other apes. You know, mom takes care of this kid, and then when it's weaned, it may still hang around, but it gets its own lunch, and then she has another one. Well, that's not the case in in humans. Mothers have help. Others are contributing. The grandmothering story makes that start with grandmothers. This style of parenting, or grandparenting, is what Hawks says makes us human. Hawks has been testing her hypothesis using mathematical models and simulations. And so now this is this little toy world that we're operating in, in which there is an ape-like life history. And as long as there's no grandmothering, it maintains an equilibrium that looks 
very similar to the other great apes. But if grandmothering is added to the model... They start to move to another equilibrium that is just like what we see in in modern people hunting and gathering for a living. Um, so there's the ape-like equilibrium, and then with grandmothering, and that's all that's in the model. There are no brains, there's no hunting, there's no... And um, grandmothering is enough to take the populations to something that looks very much like, you know, what we actually see in the, in the real world. Hawks' grandmother hypothesis reframes the conversation about human evolution. When scientists were focused on the importance of big game hunters, women were overlooked, especially older women. And what makes Hawks' work so remarkable is this fundamental idea that older women, grandmothers, might be responsible for everything we are today. Hawks is going to keep focusing on grandmas. Her current research is looking at how grandmother's cooking helped get us to where we are now, which reminds me of certain hypothetical babies in certain hypothetical cribs. Here's Claudia and Eli again. Well, the other thing, Eli, is should you ever decide once upon a you know day in the future, know that I will be there. Nice. And uh, I will I will use that. I will, <laughs> right. Yeah. And the little room is there. <laughs> <laughs> I don't I don't feel any pressure from this conversation. And you should not feel any. But talk to me in ten years. <laughs> for origin stories, I'm Skylar Swenson. And I'm Meredith Johnson. Thanks for listening. Origin Stories is a project of the Leaky Foundation. The Leakey Foundation advances human origins research and offers educational opportunities to cultivate a deeper, collective understanding of what it means to be human. We provide venture capital for scientists through research grants and share their groundbreaking discoveries through our podcast, website, and lectures. We also give scholarships to students from developing countries to attend field schools and earn advanced degrees. You can learn more at leakeyfoundation.org. That's L-E-A-K-E-Y foundation.org. You can also find and follow the Leakey Foundation on Facebook and Twitter. This episode was produced as part of the Being Human initiative of the Leakey Foundation and the Bauman Foundation, dedicated to understanding modern life from an evolutionary perspective. Visit leakeyfoundation.org slash beinghuman to learn more. Transcripts are provided by Adept Word Management, Intelligent Transcripts, Visit adupwordmanagement.com for all of your transcription needs. This episode was produced by Skylar Swenson. Our editor is Audrey Quinn. Our theme music is by Henry Nagel.